The LinkedIn Podcast Network is sponsored by TIAA. TIAA makes you a retirement promise, a promise of a guaranteed retirement paycheck for life. Learn more at TIAA.org backslash promises pay off. I'm Maura Aarons Mealy, and this is The Anxious Achiever. We look at stories from business leaders who have dealt with anxiety, depression, or other mental health challenges, how they fell down, how they picked themselves up, and how they hope workplaces can change in the future. Throughout this season, we're thinking about the ways we can build mentally healthier workplaces from the inside out. And before we can really talk about external solutions, we have to get to the root of problems that we're facing in our lives, but ones especially that come to us during the workday, that distract us, that may cause us to sit and ruminate and feel hopeless when we're supposed to be feeling productive. Life and work, it's not separate anymore, for better or for worse. I, like many people, spend most of my work hours in the online world. I'm constantly stimulated, scanning through tweets and posts and blogs and headlines. It can feel like a blur, and then your brain latches on to something. Today's guest caught my attention when she used the phrase, mental fire, which seemed like it would resonate with a lot of our listeners. For me, the mental fire is that worry that I latch on to, the terrifying news about climate, about the coronavirus, the sense that bad things will happen. And I find it very difficult to shift and focus on my work. I want to feel positive, but instead, I feel scared. I'm excited to speak today with Christina Blacken. She's founder and chief narrative strategist at The New Quo, where she helps leaders and organizations think about how they communicate and tell the stories that drive change forward. And I started our conversation by asking her about what mental fire means to her. I had written that because that was after a series of things had been occurring with the whole issues in Afghanistan. There was multiple natural disasters occurring at the same time all types of human rights issues. And I remember thinking, what can I do right now to make sure that I don't be consumed and paralyzed to the point that I don't want to do anything Mm -hmm. and that I don't want to do action and I don't want to tune in and I don't want to feel like I'm giving up on the idea of us getting better as a society healing. So what can I do to get over that? And I remember thinking through conversations I had had in the past and things I had written in the past around social justice, because it's a long game. It's a marathon. It's not a sprint. There's so many incremental steps that make social change occur. And so it's easy to get fatigued and to lose sight of the long-term goals. And so I started to examine that again. I remember some of the tactics and things I had shared when being in the trenches and working in social issues. My work is all around inclusion and equity and changing the paradigms of leadership specifically. And at times, it's easy to be like, ain't nothing changing. People are crazy. I'm over this. Hands in the air. And I think the internet, because it's very easy to get in sort of a insular group of yelling at each other, that people are all sort of piling on and saying everything's going to hell in a handbasket. There's nothing we can do. The world is terrible. And so I wanted to add some other perspective around it. How can people still stay sane and stay balanced and stay informed without being completely overwhelmed or feeling like there's nothing they can do and being completely helpless and sort of numb and paralyzed in action? So that's why I had shared that. And it really comes down to looking at the broader picture, remembering history And taking note of some of the progresses and advances we have had and the wins that we have had, because there have been many. And also just making sure we're taking care of ourselves mentally, emotionally, spiritually, and not just burning ourselves out to the point where we can't do anything. Because that doesn't change anything either. And that's typically what keeps the status quo going is people being disengaged and detached, essentially. So if we do want to see improvements, doing nothing or being a pessimist or a cynicist to the point of 
no action doesn't actually change anything. You wrote, I check my news feed like I breathe air. Ditto. My feed is a swirling pulsation of news, opinions, and calls to action, and baby pics. But you said the duality of this blessing of instant access to information comes with the curse of information overload and and that now it's so scary and disheartening. You, you said the news at large feels like taking two basketball sized globs of sriracha sauce and throwing them into your, both of your eyes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Is that not the truth? It's literally like, oh, it's, what's on fire today? What hurricane is barreling down <laughs> this this weekend? You know, It's really, I mean, yes. And then there's also, I think, the compounding factor of when you work alone, like a lot of us are working in a more isolated way physically, right? We're, we're so dependent on the internet. And, and maybe this is also coming from a place of privilege, but like feeling detached and depressed is sometimes easier in a way. Yeah. And I think, you know, and the thing I wrote, I mentioned processing and sitting with your feelings is an important part of all of this, because I think why we're in this place is we've been conditioned and encouraged to numb ourselves and to Mm -hmm. detach from our feelings. And even if we're detaching from them, it doesn't mean they don't get expressed. And it doesn't mean that feelings and emotions aren't there. They're just then expressed in super dysfunctional, destructive ways. Like what? Like violence, anger in ways that are harmful for other people, oppressive laws that we keep seeing people pass because of their anxieties and fears. Um, I really think a lot of the inequities that we're seeing play out is because of repressed emotions and people's fears and anxieties not being processed in healthy or functional ways. So in a society that encourages us to be anti-emotional and anti-feeling, it's going to come out whether we want to process it and address it or not. And so I think it is an important step to say, I'm sad. This stuff is not great. I don't feel great about this. How am I feeling about this? How does it feel in my body? How is it showing up in my day-to-day physicality? Am I feeling a gut pink in my stomach? Am I having weird muscle spasms and headaches, like all of that is sometimes indicative of how we're expressing stress, how we're expressing anxiety or fear. And I think processing that's really important. One of the ways that I do that is I sit down and I just write through it. I write all the things I'm thinking, no matter how wild, no matter how crazy or stressed they may be, I put them down on a page and it gives me time to just at least express them and to state them and to acknowledge this is what I'm feeling in the moment. And then I'll usually go back after some time and start to read through it and reflect on it and to see which parts of those things need some sort of plan of action, which some of those things just need to sit and pass and which of those things are just completely false and aren't realities that I have to acknowledge as truth. Just because mm-hmm. you have a feeling doesn't mean it's true. Right. And I think that facts. Exactly. I think processing our feelings is an incredibly important function and skill that many of us are not taught. And we learn over time trial and error. And I know for myself, I had to learn that through reading, writing, therapy, other modalities on my own as an adult to be able to function and to be able to survive adversity and crisis. Because how you respond to adversity and crisis really defines your life. Adversity and crisis is always going to happen. It can be unpredictable. It's inevitable. But our responses to it really define our the quality of our lives, define how we show up, defines our values. So I think, yes, it's incredibly important to acknowledge that and to also process it and move through it and not ignore it or pretend it doesn't exist, or the other side of it, wallow in it to the point where you can't function. Because all of those things themselves are not healthy either. I want to go back to the systemic view, because I think it's really important. And and this is my belief. And, and again, I, I've never seen data to back this up. But I want to, I want to go back to where you talked about um, a lot of oppression that shows up in our laws, in our workplace, in toxic leadership comes from an inability to express fear, anxiety, a lot of uncomfortable feelings. I think there's a lot of really interesting research about the amygdala and our response to uncertainty and fear. And they found that typically when we are confronted with something new, whether that's a new person, a new experience, we many times go into hypervigilance because Mm -hmm. of evolutionary reasons. We're always trying to find ways to see who's safe, who's unsafe, who can we trust, who's going to have our back when something 
big happens and we need support because we're an interdependent species. We depend on each other for our literal survival. And I think it's always interesting when people are like, I'm a lone island. I don't need anybody. It's like, even if you're a lone island, all the supplies that you have right now were probably made by hundreds of people you don't know. And you wouldn't have been able to have them without those individuals. So we are an interconnected species who are very in tune with our social connections and are always sort of on the hunt for potential threats. That being said, some of that evolutionary bias is over amplified and many times is detrimental to healthy collaboration, healthy communication. And so many of the laws that we have now are built on zero sum ideas. The idea of there's only so many resources that we have, some deserve it more than others. And it's okay that some people have more than others do. And there are all these narratives and myths that get taught through history, education, media, schooling, your family of origin that justify those gaps, that justify those inequalities. And many times when you break down those myths, they start from an idea of that group, that identity, that potential other is dangerous, is scary, is threatening. And so we have to control it. We have to police it. We need to kill it. And that's really a function of a majority of the inequalities and laws and oppressive things that we've seen. And so a lot of my work, I teach the idea of narrative inquiry to really unpack what are the stories that have built your point of view, your perspective, your beliefs, your bias, which of those are in the way of your full potential and connecting with others and which are allowing you to see the world in a clear way. And if we don't do that process regularly, we can get really off the mark, essentially. I'm really fascinated by the idea of how our emotions, how our feelings, and specifically how our anxieties, right? Because anxiety is a fear of what's going to happen in the future. I, I want to hear a little bit about how you think these feelings and these emotions craft the narratives and the stories that then become society. It really comes down to the idea, there's a book called The Sum of Us, which I think is a great book that breaks this down, but it talks about the zero-sum theory. And the zero-sum theory is the idea that we have limited resources. If I'm going to get my fair share and survive, I need to make a story to justify why I deserve more mm. or why this potential group deserves more. And then that gets baked into all types of things. Usually it starts with media and stories and the news and the way that things are spun and positioned. And then from there, it gets trickled down into various aspects of how we talk about history, how we talk about laws. And I think it's important to remember that a lot of it's made up, even though it feels really certain and set, you know, how the world operates right now, how our economic systems operate, our political systems, our business systems, they feel like they're just these really solid always been this way sort of truth when in fact they're pretty new and they've always mm -hmm. been changing and evolving and they can change. So even though something's always been a specific way. So for example, you were not allowed to be in leadership positions or to be in politics or be a business owner as a woman or a person of color till very recently, there were actual specific explicit laws that said that was not possible. Right. And so for a long time, only one specific demographic was in positions of power now that leads to all types of imbalances when there's only one demographic represented, one perspective, one point of view. And for many people, they believe that that's just how it is because it's the natural order of things. And there's a natural difference. And all of that sort of assumption is really based on pseudoscience and fear and myth. And mm -hmm. we're seeing that play out again when we talk about the various racial issues in this country. When people are like, race doesn't matter and you should stop talking about it and it doesn't exist. And I'm like, so yes, it's a social construct, but it's a social construct with very specific impacts and consequences that are very measurable, that have been studied for decades and pretending it doesn't exist doesn't solve it. It's sort of saying cancer doesn't exist. I don't see cancer. And then <laughs> expecting us to just magically solve <laughs> Breast cancer, that's not how you saw it. I don't like cancer either, but we're not going to solve it by pretending it's not there. The LinkedIn Podcast Network is sponsored by TIAA. In the last 100 years, we've seen financial markets swing, new currencies come and go, decades of savings lost in days, all showing that a retirement plan without a guarantee, quite simply, isn't enough. So more than a retirement plan, TIAA makes you a retirement promise. A promise of a guaranteed retirement paycheck for life. A promise that pays off. 
Learn more at TIAA.org backslash promises pay off. Can you tell us a little bit about what you do with companies? I would imagine most people don't, unfortunately, have a chief narrative strategist on staff (laughs) at their job. (laughs) But tell us how you are helping organizations get rid of those toxic old stories. Yes, I love that question. So I run a company called The New Quo, and at the core of it is teaching behavioral science-based story strategies so people can change behavior and transform their culture to be more inclusive, more innovative, really more connected. And it boils down to sort of a framework that I've developed through research and through being in various storytelling and communication positions for 10 years and seeing how really impactful story is for how we think, for how we see things, for how we're influenced. And many times we're not taught how to use those things in positive and impactful and directed ways. I think people understand story when it comes to marketing and sales. And many times there's many positions where it's like, let's sell things people don't need and get them to buy stuff that is not really going to benefit them. But then when you turn it inward and use it as a tool for professional development, personal development, it can be radically powerful. And so for many of the companies I work with, they're in a change period or they're going through a period of growth And they're seeing some of the breakdown. Maybe their culture is sort of struggling or maybe their leadership needs to have a bit more training when it comes to how to really connect with the diverse and uh, team different from themselves and how to get the best out of their teams. Or maybe they're going through a phase where they're building things from scratch because they're a new company Mm -hmm. and they want to do it right from the beginning and don't, you know, build inequitable things into their practices and structures that then bite them in the ass later. So many of the people I work with, they're like, hey, we want to do training around leadership and inclusion and building better habits. How do we do that? And so I put together programs that include online learning and webinars and uh, facilitated conversations to get people to understand and be aware of what causes bias, what's the psychology of it, the history of it, the historical and social context of it, and then how do we unpack it and then reframe it and replace some of the automatic responses we have to change and difference with more healthy, impactful narratives that can get us to a better goal or to a better place. Those automatic narratives harken back to the sort of sense of fear and anxiety that a lot of people feel when their way is threatened. Absolutely, yes. And everyone goes through this process. I kind of call it the status quo changing method where we can either respond to change and difference by going through an autopilot series of values and behaviors we've been taught. Mm -hmm. And many times that starts with toxic competition, the idea that it's a zero sum game. There's not enough for everyone. We must fight each other. Um, Conformity, the idea of if people aren't part of the norm and the status quo, then they're an other and there should be distrusted. And then perfectionism, which is the idea that we don't have any error to try anything new because everything must be perfect in a specific way all the time. So those three core (laughs) values are taught through all types of means. And we pick them up as like, this is just how it is. This is how businesses are. This is how schools should be. This is how organizations should be. And it leads to responding to change and difference in very rigid and destructive ways. So I call that the culture of autopilot, which it just happens. It's automatic, but it's not necessarily healthy or productive. And I motivate and try to teach the companies and organizations I work with to move from a culture of autopilot to what I call a culture of curiosity and inclusion. And that requires acceptance, collaboration, and experimentation. Because without those three core values, you can't really respond to change and difference in a positive way. Mm -hmm. And acceptance is genuinely seeing difference as a strength and a value add versus a threat. Collaboration being the default instead of competition to the point of detrimental just failings in communication and then experimentation of we're going to try this, iterate, collect data and see what happens instead of believing we can't try anything new because there's too many what ifs, there's too many risks and we've always done it this way. So I think if you can motivate people to build that into their communication practices, their meeting practices, their brainstorming, how they make decisions, how they recruit, how they build their products and services, You can start from the ground up of building better habits because really all of this is a series of habits. We pick up communication and thinking habits from a very young age. Mm -hmm. And many times those habits feel permanent, but they can be changed. They can be changed over time and it takes incremental practice and learning over your lifetime to 
unpack the habits that are not good and to replace them with better ones. And I think seeing, so for example, I'm running a program right now with um, Nextdoor, which is a tech app that allows neighbors to refer things to each other. And most of their moderators who moderate content on the platform are volunteers. So they come to that position of being the first stop with any kind of content, whether it's biased or hateful or doesn't work for the neighborhood. They come to that position with whatever they know, and it could be good or bad. They may have a really great lens and understand history and, you know, understand their own biases, or they may not. And so there has been a wildly difference of quality when it comes to how people are moderating content and how people feel um, protected and safe in various communities on the app. And so my job was really to teach a baseline standard of how to be an inclusive moderator, how to create a sense of belonging in your community. And really it was a series of online courses and exercises to get people to see what does belonging actually look like in action and behavior. We talk about it in very nebulous esoteric ways, but there are specific practices that make belonging a real thing. And I remember looking at the data we've been collecting at this point, there's been about 22,000 people who've signed up for these trainings and almost 6,000 people have completed them. And so we're collecting all this data from before they take the course and after, and we're seeing these huge shifts in the sense of agency, people feeling like, oh, I do play a significant role in belonging and leadership in my community, regardless of my title or position. And, oh, I can actually recognize when bias is coming up in conversation for myself and for other people, and I'm going to do something about it. And before the course, many times they were like, I don't know. I don't think I could do anything about this. I don't know what that is. So it's really powerful to see a shift of perspective and a shift of habits and how that has a, a really a ripple effect and impact on how people show up. That is a really, that is fascinating. And and next door is a very visceral example because it, it's got a reputation in many communities. It can be extremely biased and, and racist in many communities. Yes. I, I want to ask you about perfectionism. A lot of listeners of this show personally struggle with perfectionism. It's, it's a real manifestation of anxiety. And, um, and you talked about perfectionism as almost like a, a, it's a, it's a product of a system that is scared to fail. Yeah. So perfectionism is such an interesting double sword because there's lots of really interesting behavioral science research around how it shows up and why it shows up. Mm -hmm. And many times perfectionists have, the best intentions in mind where they really just want to reach a good standard and to do their best work. And so perfectionism that is excellence seeking mm -hmm. is a little bit positive. So it's about so how does everybody reach their fullest potential? How can we, you know, really make sure that everything is buttoned up to get to that particular goal. But when perfectionism is about control and failure minimizing, which is different than excellence seeking, there's a significant shift in the outcome from that kind of perfection seeking. And typically it means rigidity, lack of delegation, lack of effective collaboration, um, paralysis in action. So many times chronic procrastination mm -hmm. and all those things are just ways to reduce somebody's fears of judgment and failure. And even though judgment and failure is sucky, no one wants it. If you are chronically worried about it, you're more likely to actually fail because you're not doing all the actions and behaviors that allow you to create something that doesn't fail. So that's the weird, vicious cycle of it. And I think when it comes to a lot of American society and the narratives that have been built into our laws and practices and institutions, perfectionism is at the core because we have all this American exceptionalism and the sort of myth making about freedom and liberty and many of it's positive and aspirational but it doesn't allow for a nuanced conversation. We don't even have an active conversation right now about accountability and how much that myth has failed for so many people in our society. There's a little to no error. It's almost sort of like if you sat down with a friend and you're like, Hey friend, I know you had really good intentions about freedom and liberty, but like, there's a lot of harm that's happened with some of the things that you've done. Let's talk about it. And the friend's like, Oh no, no. My intention was freedom and liberty, and you're going to like that intention, and I don't care how you feel. And that's really where we're at right now, where people are so afraid of the perfect myth of America and how it hasn't really lived up to this myth. And people well, are and protecting they're afraid of the it. Perfect, yeah, they're, they're, I, I see this also with the vaccine response where – 
um, I think people are afraid of leaders get trapped. You know, I, I, I feel bad for leaders stuck in this paradigm because in a way they, they can't win, you know, because they can't make mistakes. They are not allowed to have the learning stance, right. That we teach every elementary school kid. It's like a zero sum game again. And I don't yes. know, I feel like leaders are dealing with things that no one's ever dealt with before or not in a long time. It's very true. And it's a very cultural thing because mm -hmm. so I think in the United States, because of this idea of rigid aspiration without genuine accountability or authenticity, people are more concerned about perception than they are about the quality of what's happening. So if as a leader, you're too concerned about perception and how things look and coming off in a specific way, it's very hard to be authentic and it's very hard to be vulnerable when all you care about is appearance. And I think that's a huge part of a lot of our issues when it comes to what leadership should look and sound like, including on the other side of things where people have an expectation of perfection from our leaders, where they, if they have any tiny misstep, people are like, burn them at the stake. You know, it's like, that's not really helpful when it comes to seeing a full complicated, flawed human. Now that's different than people who are doing extremely harmful things have gotten a pass and essentially have been protected as abusers and exploiters or whatever for decades. That's right. different than someone who makes a tiny misstep or miscommunication. And everyone's like, see, you can't trust him. Look at that. Look at that. They misspelled the word communication. They put three M's. <laughs> can't, we can't trust this person. There are people who are literally like that. And I think we have to get away from this idea that leaders are all knowing mm. and that they know ev more than everybody else. Leaders play a role of essentially aligning everyone to opportunities and making sure their unique talents are expressed in the best ways possible for a goal. That does not mean that they are the most all knowing experts of the land. Everyone has a level of knowledge and wisdom and potential skills that other people don't based on their life experiences and where they were born. There's so many elements to bring a unique set of wisdom. So I don't like this idea that leaders are all knowing and everyone else doesn't know anything. It has to be a balance of, of collaboration and give and take and delegation. That's really what a leader should be doing. As we come to a close, I, I want to sort of really zero in and, and come back to the idea of quenching the mental fire and the pain. You know, I was reading Nadia Boltzweber, the pastor, and, and she wrote, I do not think our psyches were developed to hold, feel and respond to everything coming at them right now, every tragedy, injustice, sorrow, and natural disaster in real time, every minute of every day, you know, it comes back to that sense of sometimes because of the internet, we know too much for our poor little monkey brains to <laughs> manage. <laughs> and, um, and leaders are feeling this too, right? We're, we're really struggling to, to keep it together ourselves to help our teams keep it together. And I'd love to hear your advice to people just hoping to quiet our mental fire and do good work every day and, and do our part, but not also feel beholden to take it all on? I love this question because I think we also have to keep in mind that we have a penchant for negativity. There's actually, mm -hmm. again, I, you know, I love research. There's a lot of really great <laughs> research about negativity bias. And one of those reasons is because we we far more focus and amplify the negative in our hopes of controlling uncertainty yes. and change. And so Many times social media, because of that human pension of loving seeing a train wreck and staring at the fires, it skews towards that. The algorithm skews towards shock, sensationalism, negativity. So there's an over-amplification of all the bad that's happening and an under-amplification of the good. And there are platforms who have been created to kind of combat that, like positive news and you know, um, the feel good project, there's all these different things that are trying to create balance. But that being said, that's why it's important for people to individually create that balance for themselves. So it means being able to really think about your consumption mm -hmm. and be very conscious and intentional of it. So what things actually inspire you, what makes you laugh, what fuels your creativity, what are places where you can learn about problems in ways that are more holistic versus a 140 character soundbite mm -hmm. of the issue. And then having that balance and making sure that's occurring in 
conjunction with the news is incredibly important. And also limiting your time spent on those platforms. And I know that can be challenging, especially in our current world where social media is such a huge part of sharing information and staying connected. As a small business owner, I use social media all the time. Yeah, yeah. I mean, like um, it's part you of the job. To. Yeah. You yeah. really have to. But there are ways that you can limit the amounts of times you're going on per day, the amount of time you spend, and ultimately the people that you're following and the things that you're reading. So I would recommend that first, which is balancing your consumption with inspiration, education, learning, skill building, and not just consumption of people's anxieties and worries and fears and all the bad that's happening all the time, because that's not good for your brain. And it's also not truth. It's not the reality that every single thing in every single place is bad all of the time, 100%. That's just not true. Yeah. Um, so I think that's also good to balance that and to remember and build our reflective function to say, this is bad, but this isn't 100% everything that's happening all the time. It's the thing that's most amplified because we have a negativity bias. We skew towards it because we think it will help us to function and to be safe. I would say another thing that's important is to also find communities of people who share your same values. I know right now people sometimes are struggling because they're dealing with really contentious, very polarized, opposite of values with family or friends. And I think finding safe havens with people who genuinely share your same values around you, just basic human rights, basic equality, basic treating people with respect and kindness, regardless of what they look like genuinely. I mean, a lot of people say, oh yeah, I believe in that. But then if you hear them talk, they don't. So I think finding that, that same sort of like-minded, socially conscious community is really important. And it can start with just small baby steps of one-on-one conversations and building from there. Because when you find that community, then you don't feel so crazy. You don't feel like, oh my gosh, all these people are just out here with you know their pitchforks and things on fire. Like, what are we doing? And then you find people who are doing things and who do have interesting solutions and perspectives. And it's great to be connected to those people and to talk to them and even support their work if they are activists or writers or on the ground or providing social services, whatever that is. So I think that's another important part. And then the other thing is to understand the actions that you do want to take. I usually talk about taking a power inventory, like what are the, all the areas that you have potential power related to certain a power problems? inventory? Yeah, where it's like, what are the various levers of power and influence I do have? And everyone has them, whether it's their connections to certain communities and groups, whether it's their resources they're able to share um, physically, mentally, emotionally, whether it's their power of word and and how they speak and what they write and what they share in terms of education. And I think just you kick out some time where you're like, okay, I'm going to donate to these amounts of causes. I'm going to reach out to these potential people. I'm going to write these letters to these local um, politicians, or I'm going to call my Senator and I'll do that this many hours a week. And Mm -hmm. I'll feel like at least I've done something. I think if everyone did small incremental steps like that and millions of people are doing them coincidentally, there's huge amounts of change that can occur from that. So we don't want to discount all the small daily ways that people can show up because that's really a way that a lot of change happens. It's sort of a collective organizing, collective action is really how change occurs. And we've seen that happen again and again. Anytime there's been significant social changes through collective organizing. So I think that's the third step is what are some of the small ways I can, maybe there's not a lot I can give, but I can give my time. I can give my energy. I can give money in certain ways. I can connect the right people, whatever that might be. It's a powerful way to feel like, okay, I can't solve everything overnight. It's not all on my shoulders to do this, but I have taken some level of action. Let's, let's, let's round out now. I want to talk a little bit about um, how creativity can both calm us and heal and help change stories. And tell us a little bit about your five minute a day rule. So creativity in and of itself is interesting because many people feel like if I don't have a specific skill, if I'm not Jay-Z or Van Gogh, (laughs) how am I going to be creative? And creativity is really just problem solving and taking things that don't seem connected and making new interesting connections and insights. That's all it is. And that can occur anywhere. It can occur when you cook. It can occur when you garden. It can happen in the ways that you consume books and how you make connections between various types of art. 
So I think it's important to have a creative practice, whether you feel like you're an artist or not, because it's a natural human skill. And we all are built with creativity and express ourselves creatively very freely as kids until we get into systems where they say creativity is not for you if you're not exponentially talented at specific modalities. So Mm. letting go of that concept that creativity has to be for commercial consumption or for building fame. And that's the only reason we should pursue it. I think letting that go is really important. And also realizing that creativity is one of the few times where we can feel really present in ways where we can kind of lose a sense of time and space. And that can be really healthy for you to be able to spend your time and energy being fully present and immersed in an activity um, that isn't necessarily about escapism. You're building and creating something So that's really healing for your brain. It can help your mind to calm down. It can help you to feel a sense of accomplishment. It can improve serotonin, which is really great for your mood. So even just writing for a few minutes a day, drawing, dancing to music, you know, playing, cracking jokes, whatever the ways you like to express that can be really powerful. And I think for myself, my five minute practice has been just consuming fun comedy and and content that I think is really interesting or makes me think differently and writing. I think writing has been really powerful for me because I'm able to get my emotions and feelings down on the page and get it out. And then just start to, to really think about various ideas or things I've been thinking about generally and find new connections between them. And having that writing practice has been really helpful for Mm. my healing, overcoming really serious issues of finding new insights in my work it wouldn't have happened if I hadn't had some level of writing practice. I don't do it every day. I would like to get to a daily point of it, but I write enough for it's a, just a regular thing in my life. Like I'm constantly sort of journaling and writing things down and, and noting stuff and putting things on paper and putting them into digital places. And that's been really helpful for me to be able to ride the ups and downs of life and to remember things. I like my memory uh, is not the greatest sometimes. And I'm like, if I don't write things down, I'm gonna be like, what did I do in 2021? I don't remember all I did. I think all I did was sit inside and like, that's not totally true. So it's good to have a sort of a recollection and to look back and to see memories in, in more visceral detail and color because it's the immediate time it's happening. Getting all those details down can be really good for you too. So that's what I recommend. Just find some way to express yourself, to find play in your day-to-day life. That doesn't feel like you have to do it. It's just something that could be fun. Mm -hmm. Um, And that in and of itself can have so many benefits down the line that you don't even know. Mm, I love it. Well, thank you so much, Christina Blacken. Thank you for having me. This was a great conversation. That's it for today's show. Thank you to my producer, Mary Dew. Thanks to the team at HBR I'm grateful to our guests for sharing their experiences and truths. For you, our listeners, who ask me to cover certain items and keep the feedback coming, please do send me feedback. You can email me. You can uh, leave a message on LinkedIn for me or tweet me at Mora AM. And if you love the show, tell your friends. Subscribe and leave a review. From HBR Presents, this is Mora Aaron's Mealy.